for this presentation, I'd just like to do a quick overview in with respect to God's grace. In here I've entitled it God's Grace in Three Dimensions. So let's get started. First of all, let's get into a definition of what God's grace is. In the Old Testament, it's uh, called Ka Cain. And it means kindness, favor. And that's derived from kanen, which means to stoop in kindness to an inferior, to favor, to bestow. So from this, it's derived that God's grace is God stooping down to us in his kindness, bestowing his favor upon us. New Testament definition is from charis. It means gratifying, divine influence upon the heart, a benefit, favor, a gift, a joy, a liberality. And it's derived from cario. And this means to be cheerful, happy, well off. From this, it's derived, it's God pouring into us and upon us his gifts because he favors us. Another definition is with an acronym, God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace is God's loving kindness toward us. Grace is a gift. It cannot be earned. It can never be deserved. And its importance is revealed in the book of Proverbs, where it's written, A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, loving favor rather than silver and gold. And in the book of Hebrews it's written, For it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods that have not profited those who have been occupied with them. Also, the salutation, Grace, to you is found in every letter written by the Apostle Paul to the churches. Psalm 63, it says, Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. This brings us to the first dimension of grace, known as prevenient grace. And I just want to pause here and just remind that all grace is God's grace and this is just God's grace from our viewpoint so with prevenient grace I want to preface it by this God is love it's agape type love and God always acts with love God is love and God has created us for his love So the term prevenient is just a fancy term that means to come before. So prevenient grace is God's favor toward us that came into our lives before any decision on our part. Which means that God did not wait around for us to look for him first. He took the initiative. <clears throat> and prevenient grace in the famous... Um, verse of John 3.16, we see it, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. It's where he took the initiative. Now with prevenient grace, we're confronted with bad news, and that's human sin. Human sin has alienated us from God, from others, and from one another, and even from our own selves. Human sin is the inward, destructive condition that manifests itself in various ways. Another way of looking at sin is the attitude, my life is all about me. And going on, your life should also be all about me. And then finally, at its worst peak, it is all about me. Human sin is anything that diminishes the life that God intends for us to have. However, we have good news. 
there is more grace in God toward us than there is sin in us. Every one of us needs to have our own personal spiritual experience with Jesus. And I mean the, the true Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is one of the three persons of the Trinity. He is God the Word made flesh. So, we come now to the second dimension, and that's justifying grace. Justifying grace is God's favor toward us to clear us from every sin in our lives, from birth to death. It is the miracle by which God makes me just if I'd never sin. And it reveals that God preferred to take hell upon himself than for us to end up there due to our sins. And that's what Jesus going to the cross for us was all about. Jesus himself said, No greater love than to lay down one's life for his friends. No greater love does anyone have than this, to lay down his own life for his friends. And Jesus definitely did that for us. With justifying grace is a reminder that the redemption from sin is costly. No rich man with the multitude of his wealth could ever redeem us from sin. So with justifying grace, we see that Jesus absorbed into his body all of our sins. The love of God in Jesus paid to the justice of God. He took all the wrath and condemnation of our sins upon himself. Jesus exhausted all of God's wrath against our sins. Jesus himself is our ransom. He's our propitiation. <clears throat> so with justifying grace, we see that after, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, justifying grace is whosoever believes upon him should not perish. Justifying grace, we experiencing it the moment we say yes to Jesus, it's we consent to allow Jesus to love us. We consent to allow Jesus to save us. We say yes to that relationship with God. And here poses a question. Will you open your heart to God and accept the relationship with him that he freely offers us to us in his son, Jesus Christ? That is definitely something to think about. This brings us to the third dimension of God's grace. It's sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace, we just preface it by this. God accepts us just as we are, but he loves us too much to leave us that way. It is God himself and Jesus is the one who makes us. It's not we who make ourselves. Sanctifying grace is God's favor at work in us, transforming us into the people he intended us for us to be, even before he made us. So, with, in sanctifying grace, we are predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And as believers, that is what will happen. We are predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus, and it takes a lifetime. So there are times in our walk with Jesus where, where we are in step with the Holy Spirit, who takes residence within us, and our own physical bodies are considered sacred to him. They are called temples of the Holy Spirit. But there are times in our Christian walk where we want like to pull into in the wrong direction, often presumptuously not really seeing or thinking we're doing anything wrong, 
and the Holy Spirit kind of holds us back. But there are other times when the Holy Spirit wants us to move and we kind of are hesitant and we just um, are just not wanting to, to go because we're not sure. With sanctifying grace, we are transformed from glory to glory as we see Jesus more. And this, we need this renewal continually. <clears throat> we need our minds continually renewed <clears throat> by the Holy Spirit, especially in this um, world we live in that is dominated by that satanic spiritual fog of Antichrist. That is, as we see Jesus more, we have Jesus imprinted to our spirit. In that sense, um, being conformed to his image, we have his image imprinted to our spirit, and it shines out through us in our daily lives. So, in John 3.16, <clears throat> the sanctifying grace is shown this. So after, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that begotten Son is Jesus Christ, that whosoever believes upon him should not perish. Now here's the sanctifying grace part, but have everlasting life. It could not be, um, if it, it, that means it could not end. If it did end, it would be temporary life, not everlasting. So, we can say that with sanctifying grace, I have been saved by grace. I am being saved by grace, in the, always in the process, and I will be saved by grace. And here is how we, we see it work. Prevenient grace, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that is toward the all of mankind. And coming up to that moment of decision for those of us who respond to the faith of Jesus given by the Holy Spirit, and we believe upon him, we should not perish, and we are justified at that very moment, and our and we are changed irreversibly changed inwardly and then but have everlasting life and then we have the sanctifying grace all the way up until the time of our our death or departure from earth when it, the sanctifying work of God in Jesus through his Holy Spirit is done in us so brings up a question to ponder. Why not allow for the possibility of Jesus Christ to bring us into perfection? This is something to ponder. And to wrap it all up, grace, it's God's favor in his agape love towards us.